time to sort of mull over even more so because you're talking about it so much. I must have done 90 interviews so far. And you're asking the best questions, by the way, I've ever been asked about this book. Turn down the weed! All right, Truth Seekers, welcome back to the show. I'm really jacked today to have a guest on who's written a book called No-Go Zones. We're going to talk about what they are, why they're important, and why Rahim goes there. This is Rahim Kassam, and Rahim is a uh, former colleague of, what was his name, Muhammad Mwazi, a.k.a. Jihadi John, a.k.a. MC Hammer Rabbi. They used to do rap battles together in the parking lot in London. Rahim, how are you doing, buddy? How are you? That's right, and he was terrible at them. He really wasn't good at all. <laughs> No, I actually did go to university with him, though. Um, he was two years below me, but luckily I never, never bumped into him. Um, you know, I think I think if I had bumped into him, knowing what I know now, I would have lost my head. <laughs> <laughs> I was just telling, uh, bro, he made a hilarious joke about what did you say about socks on Gad Sad's podcast? You just nailed it. No one. I can't even remember now. I think I was drunk during that. <laughs> Well, he reacted the same way I did, so apologies in advance. So yeah, uh, Vanilla Ice Pick was a former classmate of yours, and uh, so is he the only uh, terrorist uh, monster that you're familiar with? Or have you come across any others in your line of work? Well, well, I have I have met many people who have previously been radical Islamic uh, fundamentalists who have uh, been part been members of groups like Hizbut Tahrir, which is a, well, they call it a non-violent extremist organization right, right. Um, in, the, in the United Kingdom. You know, we've got all these weird words now, these Orwellian words that we have to use to describe these groups. I, 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 don't, I just call them, I just call them evil. You know, I just call them moronic evil as well. Inbred evil in a lot of these cases as well. Um, so I, I never, I don't think I've ever come across somebody who actually then went on to commit another, another, sort of atrocity or, or join Islamic State or anything. But it's interesting, in my, in my job, as, in my day job, uh, we have interviewed and uh, covered protests and marches and things from people who are now uh, locked away in prison for um, both funding, facilitating, recruiting for terrorism. And you never, you never sort of think of it at the time when you're hanging around, you know, in Tower Hamlets doing some filming, that this guy you're filming in three years is going to be you know, locked away for, for, for on terrorism charges, you just sort of go go ahead and do it. But it's, it's, yeah, it's quite queer to think of. So uh, I got a lot of stuff from the book. I read the whole thing, which I'm really happy about because sometimes I don't finish them, I'll be honest. But uh, you, mm. uh, I'm sure you know this already, but I feel like a lot of books are aggregate information. And my question is always, what am I going to learn from this? But because you actually went into the no-go zones, Talk to the people who live there and got opinions from members of the press, people shouting at obscenities at you on bicycles and shop owners. I feel like you really kind of gave us a good look at what happens in the zones and you make a really good case for why we can't allow them to continue to spread. I notice on the map behind you, you've got California already plastered as a no-go zone. Um, your right ear is kind of hanging right by my hometown there. So I don't know if that means we're being encroached or what. What I've done here is signaled as to how um, – there should be no California in the United States of America. <laughs> so I've just, I've covered it. They're working on that. They're working on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I want to start with the back of the book. In the epilogue, you wrote something really interesting. You said you could have written six. Can you hear me? Yeah, I so said that's news to me. Oh, yeah. No, it's in the back. Everyone should check it out. After <laughs> they buy the book, of course. You said you yeah. could have written 600 more pages on riots to language barriers, to massive deprivation, to voter fraud, from extremism, to terrorist links, to authorities who no longer enter certain areas. And I thought it kind of wraps up the entire uh, tenet of your book, which is that those are all progressive tent poles, right? You can't go to any big progressive city and not have that described to a T. So aren't they the perfect breeding grounds and ripe for the harvest for no-go zones? Yes, of course. I mean, all of these places across Europe that have turned into no-go zones are traditionally socialist, if not communist, controlled areas. You know, and I don't say communist in, with my tongue in my cheek, um, as as people might call, you know, Hillary Clinton over here or something like that. These are actual communist parties that still exist in Europe that control uh, parliamentary seats and and councils and local authorities and things like that. Um, these are the areas where they put these people. Uh, these are the areas where um, the big uh, government-funded uh, ghettos are. 
are what you would call housing projects. And if you go to the middle of these towns, you'll see a notice board um, often in the middle of these towns and they have, you know, pin board stuff on them. And a lot of the posters are, you know, come and join your local socialist party, come and attend one of our meetings. If you need more welfare, if you're not getting enough money, call this number, um, all of this sort of stuff. And of course, uh, in these neighborhoods as well, you then also see signs that are like, is your husband beating you? Call this number. And it's like you've got you've got the cause and the effect right there in front of you. Do you go to the same office? Like, does that number route to the same desk if you call for free stuff and if your husband's beating you or do you got to make two trips? Yeah, it actually connects straight through to the DNC headquarters. <laughs> so one of the things I didn't know about no-go zones, you mentioned in the book that Islam or, or Muslims are about 10 percent of prison inmates in America, despite being 1% of the population. Then you said that in France, they are 10% of the population and 60% of the prison uh, population, which to me seems unbelievable. Back that up. That sounds hateful and bigoted. And I don't know if I would, it's fake news. Yeah. Um, well, it, these are government statistics. So I would imagine actually I'm, I'm lowballing you know, with, with that sort of stuff. Um, these are the same statistics, by the way, these are the same statistical organizations that tell us that migration into the United Kingdom is around 600,000 gross every year. And that's a lie, too. That's a lowball estimate, even though that's the size of two major cities into the country every year. Um, that's a lowball estimate. So I, I would say there are probably more. The, the percentages are probably higher uh, than the government would have us believe. Uh, but what what is happening? Okay, let's just break it down very simply. The left wants these people over because, I mean, I'll quote Andrew Nether here. He was a former advisor to Tony Blair, where he said to rub the right's nose in diversity. That's what they wanted. They wanted nice. to fundamentally change and reconstitute what, what Western civilization looked like. Um, so they bring these people over. Um, they give them free money. They give them free houses. In some places, for instance, in Sweden, they give them free cars. Um, they give them nothing to aspire to. Uh, this is, by the way, the complete and utter deprivation and degradation of the human spirit. They make these people nothings, right? They put them in these areas. They go to the cafe, to the mosque, to the cafe, to the mosque, and then home. And then the next day, and then the next day, and then the next day. Their lives are without purpose and without meaning. But they bring them over and they sell it to us on both multiculturalist grounds and they sell it to us on economic grounds. Don't forget what Angela Merkel said. When the migrant crisis started, oh, these people are doctors and engineers and nurses, and they're going to go into civil society and become really great and economically productive. Well, we've had two years now of this, and the, the jobs numbers are stunningly low. You know, out of the millions of people that ended up coming over into Europe, just 54 found jobs with major German companies. Uh, that's not 54%. That's not 54,000. That's 54 um, now, what happens then is that these neighborhoods become deprived because there's no investment, there's no one able to spend good money, there's no businesses being built up. In fact, just last week in Sweden, um, one of the uh, one of the local business owners in in the suburb, I think it was Husby, uh, said we can't function properly because these areas are too dangerous, and even private security companies won't come and secure these areas. So what ends up happening? Well, what ends up happening is exactly what I experienced in these areas like Husby, like Rinkaby, is there a very high local crime rate, very, very high local crime rate. And that crime can be anything from petty theft, uh, bigger you know, robberies, uh, drug dealing, uh, mass drug consumption, um, uh, physical abuse, assault, sexual abuse, rape. All of this stuff is being... Um, it's been concentrated into these areas. And so it's not even surprising that these people would be in higher numbers in prisons, in the prison systems, because they are being trapped in criminality and poverty by socialism and by socialists. And, you know, the argument we always hear, the narrative is that these people behave this way because of poverty. I mean, Jen Psaki, who I got to see at Politicon in L.A., which was fantastic, talked about how these people just need jobs, right? And you make an interesting observation. You said in Sweden that three police officers leave the force every single day. And the murder rate went up from twenty went up from 2014 to 2015, about 26%. I mean, just astronomical number. And then you yeah. talk about this idea of state-inflicted versus self-inflicted poverty. I want you to talk about that because it was fantastic. Yes. Well, look, uh, over the course of having had this book come out, whatever it was, two and a half weeks ago now, um, 
it gives you time to sort of mull over even more so because you're talking about it so much. I must have done 90 interviews so far. Um, and because you're talking about it so much and being challenged on the ideas so much, you also develop those ideas even further, which is why I'd love to do no-go zones too as quickly as possible. Um, look, this, this it, to me, it, it, what I said a moment ago about the left effectively using these people, stripping them of, of human basic human dignity and using them as a cudgel by which to beat the right and beat Western civilization and our history and our culture and our values, um, that is, for me, where it starts on our side of the equation. On their side of the equation, you have to look at it like this. Out of the millions of people that ended up coming over to Europe from 2015, you have a very low number of people actually going into the workplace. But they've also been polled as to how how much they want to go into the workplace, and the numbers there are stunningly low as well. There are, you know, at least uh, at least 40% of them say they don't want jobs, let alone can't get jobs because they were promised. Don't forget, free house, free car free money, you know, raise your kids, go to the cafe, go to the mosque and come home. Um, and so they have no, or they have very little inclination uh, within this group to actually be productive and constructive members of, of, of Western civilization too. Um, you have, let's take a, let's take a longer term thing. You have uh, Turks who have been migrating into Germany now for about five or six decades on mass uh, who have the exact same problem. Uh, low job rates, low employment rates amongst the Turkish population in Germany, and a low impulse, a low instinct to actually try and get jobs or to even want jobs. Um, they don't feel like they need to or should work. They feel like, you know, the victimhood mentality that they've been told to have tells them that they should be entitled to free stuff because somebody 300 years ago who happened to be white did something bad in Istanbul. Hey. You know, I guess for someone who's just joining the show, they think, well, what is a no-go zone, right? So we got to start with the obvious question. I think that you uh, you made a really good point that they're not just locations, but they're also mindsets. And that's the case you build up in your book uh, and some of the things that are consistent in the mindset among the different locations where they're at. And you said the most heinous and worrisome outgrowth of no-go zones is terrorism and that America had better pay attention. So I think it's important for people to know that you actually broke the story at Breitbart London about the 2000 or so sexual assaults in Cologne. And as I reread that in the book, I remember it happening and thinking, it's interesting to hear your thoughts about how you were worried about publishing the story. And you said Islam is a no-go zone. I think there's a corollary there. So talk to us about that. Well, you know, this is the thing that I wish the, the uh, establishment media understood about us is, and I say us, I mean, myself and my colleagues at Breitbart London and Breitbart as a whole is that, you know, it is a very, very thoughtful place to work. Um, we don't hit publish on things on a whim, especially not serious cases like this. It was moments after, uh, you know, New Year's Eve, uh, it was in on New Year's Day where I started to see some strange reports in local German papers that there had been some sexual assaults near the station. And of course, having followed the migrant crisis for so long, um, we we began to sort of think, oh, well, you know, I wonder if it's related to that at all. I mean, in any case, uh, that happening in public would have been a massive story. Um, but that's what my mind, you know, went to be just because of how how uh, the migrant crisis had taken taken its course uh, in terms of sexual assaults um, in Europe up until that point. So I started to look into this, and um, I thought to myself, right, there isn't enough information out here at the moment. So I'm just I'm just going to wait and see and see what and, you know. You follow the local papers in these right. countries for the for the most trustworthy information. The big papers. Die Welt, Deutsche Welle, uh, that's just like reading and watching CNN. It's, it's, it's a nonsense. Um, uh, about halfway through that day, my colleague um, Oliver came to me and he said, have you heard of this story? And I said, actually, yes, uh, but I, I just I haven't been able to stand it up yet. I haven't been able to feel comfortable uh, publishing on anything like this yet. And he said to me, no, I think, I think I'm at a point now where I feel comfortable with it. He had found some other sources. He had spoken to some people on the ground. Um, and uh, and we ended up publishing that story. I think we published it on the 2nd of January, actually. Um, almost immediately, you know, my heart leapt into my uh, leapt into my mouth and I thought to myself, oh, my goodness. No, you know what it was? I got an email from from uh, our editor in chief, Alex Marlowe, and our then executive chairman and now executive chairman, Steve Bannon. 
and they said this you know this this better be true you know and i was like look i feel i feel pretty confident um i you know we we've looked into this for for hours and hours and hours and hours on end now uh, and i feel pretty confident uh, it's been we've been doing nothing but fact checking this um and sure enough i'm hitting refresh on google news and all this kind of stuff to see is anybody else going to write about right. this and within a couple of hours i think the first article popped up on the independent website and then you know other people started talking about it too and yeah everyone was being overly cautious including ourselves by the way because the the the, the, the pertinent facts were still not out so you know we said you know a couple of hundred people were reported a couple of hundred sexual assaults reported well of course as the issue played itself out in the german public uh, sphere and and through the police and all that kind of stuff we we ended up realizing that it was more like a thousand uh people and more and more like two thousand incidents uh then by the way when i wrote the book i i went on to fact check with a with a colleague of mine and she said to me you've written a thousand people will believe to be participating in this uh, sexual assault um it's actually two thousand now and I was, I was like, you know, the, 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 the way in which this changed from that in, in moment of inception of when we first heard about the story all the way through to when this book came out was so drastic uh, and, 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 try, and they tried to keep it so quiet. And this comes on to the corollary of your question, which is why did they try and keep this quiet? Why were people convinced that this wasn't a good idea to report or that reporting on this had to come with caveats? Um, that said, oh, you know, but we don't know the religion of these people or anything like that. Uh, well, by and large, we we now have uh, latent and and uh, de facto uh, blasphemy laws in Europe uh, against Islam, against criticism of Islam, against linking Islam with anything nefarious, be it terror, rape, female genital mutilation, the covering of women. You know, you're not allowed to link Islam uh, to any of those things. Um, whether or not it's whether or not it's in this book, right? And I just ordered that, by the way. Thanks for the heads up on that. It's a great it's a great version of the Quran. It's called the Study Quran, and it actually will uh, take you through several different translations and interpretations, and you can make up your own mind. You can aggregate all of that information and see see what they're really saying. Um, and so, you know, the no go zone of the mind that I speak about in the book, which is related to San Bernardino as well, because nobody wanted to talk about the true underlying causes of that San Bernardino terror attack either. And I was there, by the way, uh, when it happened. Um, and, 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 and the same thing is happening in Europe at the moment. I mean, when we have a terror attack, the first instinct of almost everybody that has any semblance of power in the country, be they a journalist, a politician, a uh, community organizer, uh, who may then go on to be your president, I don't know. Um, you know, the, the, you. The, 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 their, their instinct, their instinct is, how will this impact our Muslim communities? Well, I'm not that interested in how it impacts the Muslim communities in the immediate aftermath of a terrorist attack. I'm interested in what happened with a terrorist attack. I'm interested in the lives of the people who might have died or been injured and their families. I'm interested in our public spaces being safe. I'm interested in why we keep accepting these people into the country, why we keep letting them out of prisons, who's radicalizing them in our prisons, in our school systems, uh, at our universities. Those are the questions we should be asking. Instead, we simply default to poor muslims and you made a great point i don't want to harp on it too much here but i do want to since you were the guy who broke it i want to get inside your head about what the hesitation was and the trepidation because i look at it and say let's let's analogize it to something else that we see all the time like the hurricane harvey i got in an argument the other day with someone about benghazi and he said that was so long ago you guys won't let it go i'm like wait a minute if it was hurricane harvey and we heard that there was some rain and someone died someone drowned we think okay no big deal and then we found out a month later, there were 500 people that drowned. And then six months later, it was 2,000 people. Wouldn't we start to ask very serious questions about how that information and why that information isn't shared with us? But when it's Islam, it's like, eh, we don't want to touch it. So the fact that you were nervous to print something that you had done your research on, I want to be inside your head and find out why you, of all people, someone who's obviously an Islamophobe, you know, being that you were part of the religion, how does that happen? I get why it happens for progressive journalists, but this is supposed to be the thing that you go after, is it not? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we did go after it. And we threw more resources at it than anybody else did. Uh, but that, there's, there's a difference between uh, going after something and being gung-ho. 
Uh, it's very tempting to be gung ho in these situations. Sure. It's tempting because, firstly, any journalist that tells you they can take emotion out of a story when they're covering it is a liar. Okay. Agreed. Any any journalist that tells you that they they don't have a decision either way on a given situation is a liar too. That's the difference between the likes of CNN and the likes of us. Is we don't hide where we're coming from, what we believe in, and how we interpret stories. Whereas the CNNs and the BBCs of the world want you to believe, by the way, that they're employing robots. Okay, that's effectively what they're asking you to believe. Um, and 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 we see through this, and everyone's and people are starting to see through, through this on mass. In my head, it wasn't that I was scared of the Islam issue. I I, I actually for you know to a great extent, I, I don't really care one jot what religion you are, uh, which God you pray to, uh, what leg of your pants you put on in the morning. I couldn't care less about any of those details. Uh, what I cared about was, was news, what was the, was the news, um, worthiness of the story and the, and the facts of the story. Um, this, remember, this was a pre fake news world that we were living in at that point. This, this phrase fake news had not, was not being bandied about, uh, as it is now where basically everything and nothing is fake news. Um, and so for me, it was more of a reputational thing. If we got that wrong, nobody would ever trust us again, not just on that issue, on any issue. Sure. It, was the, it was the biggest story we'd ever broken uh, in London, uh, in our London bureau, which was a small bureau at the time. You know, there was only, what, six of us. Um, it, was, it was the biggest story we'd ever broken, and it was, and it was potentially, it had such great ramifications uh, for the German government, for the police services, for the security services, for German uh, migration policy, you know, all these things. And, and you know, for me, the trepidation was, I am in a position of immense power right now, my finger hovering over that publish button. That, yeah, if you don't feel, you know, to, to, to paraphrase Tony Blair, you know, the hand of history on your shoulder in those moments, uh, then you're a, you're, you're a, you're a sociopath. That's a good point. That's a good point. Or as Theon said to Rob, if you're not scared, then you're stupid, right? <laughs> so I uh, had to get one GOT reference in there. You, you did some great. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. Stick and I, with I, that, I... man. Don't even start. <laughs> it's like lost. Once you, If you miss the bus, just stay, get the next one. Don't worry about it. Um, Sunday you... nights for me, uh, I, I, I whip this little bad boy out and I uh, – and I and I and I half read books, just like I'm sure you do. You get sent all these books, and I often half read them. Yeah, you are the Tanzanian Christopher Hitchens. I didn't even <laughs> see you had the pipe. If anyone's listening to this, close your eyes and finish the interview with your eyes closed. You're gonna think I'm talking to the Hitch right now. He's got a, he's got a lovely accent coming from a hetero male. All right, so you yeah, had no, a really no, hashtag no homo, right? Uh, well, yeah, we. <laughs> We switched it. When Trump was out, I was hashtag, it's not never Trump, it was reluctant Trump. So it's hashtag reluctant Trump uh-huh. because it is a beautiful accent. Uh, <laughs> my wife can hear me. Hold on. What is Terra Rush Jam? You had some great vocabulary lessons in the book. Let's start with that one. My Santa uh, No, not at all. Um, to, <laughs> to, to be honest with you, I don't know if there is a right way to say it. We say Taharish Kamiya. All right. But I'm sure in, I'm sure in Arabic, it's more phlegmy. Um, this is a Flemmy. Uh, okay. This is a. Um, it was a short-lived, actually, uh, sort of narrative that went through the press. But they had ascertained that, especially with uh, making links between what was going on in Egypt around the time of the Arab Spring, um, what happened to uh, was it? Gosh, I forget the name. Was it Lara Logan? Um, yes. a, you know, a j- journalist out there who was was mass sexually assaulted. They realised that there was actually a game that was being played. Um, by uh, North African and Muslim men by the name of Taharish Gamiya. And that was basically, it's, it's, it's basically gang rape. It's gang sexual assault. Um, it's designed to uh, you know, undermine women in society. It's designed to strike fear uh, into women in public places. It's designed to assert the dominance of, uh, of men um, via sexual assault. Uh, this is the real war on women that is going on uh, out there, and you and you hear not a peep from the from the feminists, from the liberal left. I often say um, you have uh, you can put four hundred thousand people on the streets of the National Mall when a president is elected, but when there's female genital mutilation going on here in Livonia, in 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 Michigan, you can't even get four hundred pink hatted protesters out there. I think that's an absolute disgrace. It's it's not just a disgrace uh, that that blights. Uh, the liberal left it actually blights your country and therefore blights uh, Western civilization. It makes the entire thing look like a joke as far as the rest of the world is concerned. And if you don't think 
the, the Kim Jong Uns um, or or the or the or anybody else who is who is antithetical to Western civilization and, and hates capitalism and hates our culture uh, is looking at incidents like that and thinking, wow. They are really, really stupid. Um, if you don't think it empowers them and emboldens them to believe that they have a better value system, uh, then then you're not you're not really a geopolitical thinker. And a lot, a lot of people like to think they are, um, but but actually, you know, these things what we're looking at, and I like to link everything together. So you know, uh, apologies for dancing around so much. Keep it going. Uh, but I but I think you can link all of these things together. Um, you know, a a. Let's let's look at Islam as a as a philosophy, as well as a culture, as well as a political uh, um, theory, and, and, and also and a, and a legal system, and all those sorts of things. You know, w- what is written in here? Uh, I, I'm in the middle of writing an article at the moment uh, that is entitled "Don't You Get It? Um, uh, Radical Islam is Sexier Than Liberalism." And and what I will go on to say in the article is that. For young people in the West, where they, especially of a Muslim background, where they see um, liberals chipping away at history, where they see them chipping away at, at institutions and ideas and, 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 and philosophy and gu- guiding principles, um, they look at it and, and, and sense a lack of purpose. And so they go and try and find the purpose in something else. You want to, you want to understand why people are so easily radicalized. And by the way, I'm, I'm of the belief that the radicalization process for Muslims in the Western world is now easier than ever. You want to look at why that is. I blame liberalism in a massive, massive part. You know, if we start eroding our institutions and our histories, tearing down statues, maybe even replacing our monarchy in the United Kingdom within the next 50 years, why are you surprised that people look for something else? You create a vacuum and nature will fill it. I mean, even Richard Dawkins, who is, you know, the most anti-theistic person probably alive today, um, uh, you know, he probably inherited that crown from 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 Christopher Hitchens when when the Hitch died. Um, but even Richard Dawkins ha- is on the record as having said, you know, I, I dislike Christianity, I dislike religion, organized religion, I dislike and, uh, the idea of a god. But Christianity is a bulwark against something much worse, uh, and that is basically my my position on this on this whole issue as well. You know, when I left Islam, I didn't leave it for another faith; I left it for no faith. Um, and I know that's unpopular on the conservative right in, in this country where I am at the moment, but I'm not going to uh, attempt to lie about it. I left I left, and, and I found nothing. I found atheism, effectively. Uh, but as I always say, I believe in all of the Ten Commandments, but the first one. Yeah, it's interesting. I've used that quote from uh, Dawkins before, and I've done it with my atheist friends to say, look, what does that say about Dawkins, though? If, if he admits that, then what he's basically saying is tearing that – Tearing down that G.K. Chesterton fence that was put up by someone else means that you've been unwittingly helping the enemy. And oh I, no, he's been he's been wittingly helping the enemy. Wittingly. Well, and for anyone yeah. who thinks that they're doing something that's proper, you don't know what's on the other side of the fence. And for me, you talk about uh, the points you made about Islam. I take them back to the liberal movement in terms of identity and gender. Right? If you strip away someone's identity, you can create anything out of them that you want, and they're the perfect void to fill with these evil ideas. And you can, can, also, can you answer me this question? Yeah. Uh, because uh, I, I, you know, I can tell you, you have thought about this a lot. Um, how come you can be born gay, but you can't be born a man or a woman? Does that make? But th- does that mean everybody's gay by this logic? Uh, that goes back to my science when it's convenient <laughs> argument. If they can't find the right. gene, then the gene can be whatever they want it to be. With the argument du jour, I'm not sure. That's a great question. Mm. It's, a, it's a great question. Uh, so I've got sections I'm here for an answer for, for, I don't have, I look, <laughs> well, I, I do have a good answer. Hold on. Let me find it in your dictionary here. Uh, you're a facade and <laughs> you're causing facade fill ours and you have to be disposed of. So let's talk about San Bernardino. Um, right. so Haney claims, so, so San Bernardino, yeah. yeah, Haney claims that Obama shut down. So you were there, you talked about kind of going under the yellow lane and nobody stopping you, which is analogous to what we were just talking about. Like, yeah, that guy right. looks official. Let him do whatever he wants. Taint the crime scene, whatever. So that was really cool. Uh, but what I didn't know was that he claims that Obama had shut down the investigation into Tablighi, sorry, I'm going to say these wrong, and believes that Obama should be hauled in front of a congressional committee. And then you went into him quoting uh, Surya 5, Ayat 33. That part kind of blew my mind a little bit. Can we talk about that? We can talk about that. I have it here in front of me. I mean, I can usually recite these things off by heart anyway, but 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 I like to be more precise when, when I have the opportunity. Um, so... 
Uh, yes, I mean, I don't necessarily, and you'll, you'll appreciate in this book, and by the way, people, buy the book. Of course. Um, well, you, no, I, I say that, I, you have to appreciate, I make one dollar per copy, so I'm not getting rich off this. This is, this is, this is for you guys to, 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 you know, uh, arm yourselves with the facts. Um, look, I'm not saying that for, for the people I interviewed for the book, I'm not saying that I weighed down either way on their testimony. I just believe that their testimony was important for that. I don't personally believe that Barack Obama personally shut down the investigation into Tablighi Jamaat, but an Obama official did, an and Obama like, appointee okay. did. Uh, and and I, I just want to make that distinction because everybody, you know, the left likes to portray us as, as, as wildly broad brush stroke, inaccurate, fake news type stuff. And I, I, I like to be more pinprick about it. Um, at least I get called a pinprick sometimes. Um, so... Haney says that the Obama administration shut down this investigation to Big Jamal. I've no doubt that that's true to the extent that uh, uh, they simply didn't have the resources. It wasn't a priority for them. They had other priorities uh, as far as they were concerned, whether it was uh, pushing the LGBT marriage issue, um, you know, uh, getting government DACA and all of this stuff was more important to them than security in the United College States. College ball uh, predictions, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, at that point, absolutely, um, mocking mocking Donald Trump at the uh, at the White House correspondence dinner, which which really ended up well for the left. Uh, that, see, you see, that is the perfect example, by the way, of hubris nemesis. Okay, um, what what they did to Donald Trump uh, at that uh, correspondence association dinner, and what ended up happening to them as a result. Anyway, I digress. Um, Phil, back to Phil Haney. Uh, look, Tablighi is Tablighi is one of the most virulent threats in the Western world today. It controls around seventy odd percent, uh, probably a little bit more than that, of the mosques in the United Kingdom. Uh, it has many, many over here as well. This is a hardline fundamentalist, literalist sect of Islam that wants to break you down. It's like a cult. It wants to break you down into your very basic form to the point which they actually dictate which side of your uh, body you should sleep on uh, in order to emulate the, the, the prophet uh, Muhammad. Um, this is a group that uh, you can tell them by their names of their mosques. They're usually Darul something, Darul Alum, Darul Islam, uh, you know, you name it. You can see it in your neighborhoods out there, I'm sure, too. Um, and they start, they've got very sneaky tactics, these guys, because they are actually quite a very charitable group as well. Um, they, uh, they do work in the community. They predominantly do work for their own communities, um, but they do work in the community. They alleviate the burdens on the state by providing charitable things like food and shelter and housing and um, meals on wheels and all this kind of stuff. They're like the Gustavo uh, Frings of uh, New Mexico. You have seen that reference, and, right? And, and, and in response, what do they want? Well, they want you to attend their, their masters. And they want you to believe in the literalist and fundamentalist interpretations of, of, of Islam as, as written here. Now, the, what, what frustrated me all the way through researching this book, and indeed frustrates me when I turn on the television, there's one in front of me right now, I've got CNN on because I like, I like to have my heart rate uh, up in the mornings. Um, and... Uh, what frustrated me was just the sheer number and sheer identifiable number of incidents in which U.S. public officials, all the way up to the president of the United States, Barack Obama, not just defended Islam, but actually promoted it and protected it from criticism. And this goes back to his Cairo speech. And this goes back to the same uh, statement that was made by the mosque in the Darul Uloom Islamiyah mosque in San Bernardino when the uh, terror attack happened. All of these things are like this. You know, they, 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 they all link up. You can't, you can't talk about one without talking about the other. Um, here's what Obama said, and here's what CARE says, the Council on American Islamic Relations, and here's what, um, what uh, the Darul Uloom Islamiyah said uh, as well. Uh, I'm, ju I'm just trying to find the... Uh, do you have it in front of you? Yeah, I do. It's on, yeah, you just you, you just you just read it. I don't have I don't have no go zones in front of me. I have the Quran in front of me. So you said that <laughs> you, you uh, it it's a now archived Obama White House speech in 2016 of February in front of the Islamic Society of Baltimore, where Obama quoted for the Quran says whoever kills an innocent, it is if he has killed all mankind. Yes. Skip a couple lines down. Islam has a tradition of respect for other faiths. And then you make the right, point so, that the same speech and same ayat was given yeah. by the uh, mosque leader. Exactly. So, so this is a care talking point that was circulated not just to, to local mosques downwards, 
but also to the highest levels of the American government. Um, and let me read you the passage uh, from the Quran as I have it in front of me. This is Surah al maidah For this reason, we prescribe to the children of Israel that whosoever slays a soul, unless it be for another soul or working corruption upon the earth, it is as though he slew mankind altogether. And whosoever saves the life of one, it is as if he saved the life of all mankind altogether. Our messengers have certainly come unto them with clear proofs. Yet even after that, many of them are prodigal on the earth. Now that, what Obama said, whosoever takes life, takes life of all mankind, whosoever saves life, saves life. That's not exactly what this says, because read it. It says, unless it be for another soul or working corruption upon the earth. Well, as far as Islam is concerned, Judaism is corruption. Atheism is corruption. Christianity is corruption, right? So th firstly, there's a, there's a caveat and get out clause immediately within that own paragraph. Now go on to the very next line that Obama didn't say and that the mosque leaders didn't say and that the Council on Islamic Relations doesn't say. Verily, the recompense of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and endeavor to work corruption upon the earth is that they be killed or crucified or have their hands and feet cut off from opposite sides or be banished from the land. That is their disgrace in this world and in the hereafter. Theirs shall be a great punishment. Save those who repent before you overpower them and know that Allah is forgiving, merciful. Well, that sounds very forgiving and merciful to me. You might you might be crucified, but if the if the caprice and the and the mercurial nature of your captor uh, somehow transitions while you're in his uh, grasp, he may forgive you uh, because he's overpowered you. That that is that is the book, and 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 the fact that your 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 president chose to lie, not just to yourselves, but lie to the entire world on that stage in Cairo, where he went prostrate before the Muslim and Arab worlds. For me, that is an act of treason. That is an act of deep, deep treachery. Um, and I don't use those words lightly. Oh, so the way I interpret it is the two verses 32 and 33 are actually written for two separate groups of people. And you have the benefit of being educated in the nuances of differences between different Muslim groups. You said at one point, I think in the French chapter, that we should be very careful about using the word Muslim too liberally. I like that. It's a very measured approach. I don't have the background experience to distinguish between the two yet. But you did mention later in the book that there is a fine line that delineates, say, Taliban from Tablighi. And you quoted them as saying, we'll shoot, you pray. And I think that is the unliberal version that most of people like me are susceptible to, which is that like Ben Shapiro's, you know, video about the myth of the peaceful Muslim popular uh, majority, right? That they may not be the ones pulling the trigger, but they are sympathetic to those who do. So when I read this, it really made me hate Obama a little bit more because I felt like this is a perfect trolling opportunity to purposely misuse the scripture to make it sound like we're all to kind of gaslight everyone and say, look, it says right here in the Quran, you're basically saving lives if you're saving your own. Oh, by the way, don't read the next verse where it says that if you're not in this group, you need to die. And then you kind of go right. one by one. You talk about Fasad Fil Ars, Afasadin, Hafiz, Fitna, Kital, Karaj. I never heard any of these words. They're fantastic. So that's not really a question, but I want you to kind of clean that up for me. Um, look, I mean, what Obama basically did is, is, is commit what a lot of people will know out there as Takiyah. Um, this is this is lying on behalf of Islam in order to fool the disbeliever or the unbeliever or the non-Muslim, in other words. Um, now, that is not me saying that Obama is a Muslim, by the way. Uh, he just has, so happens to have stumbled into this, uh, uh, you know, by the way, has roots in the Quran, this Quranic idea that you can you can um, you can fool your enemy if if you see them as working counter to 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 the goals of Islam. Would you consider him a Look, Hafiz or is he just a troll? Obama? Yeah. I mean, Obama, I mean, a Hafiz is a guy that knows the Quran fully, uh, you know, can recite it off by heart. Uh, Obama couldn't even, Obama couldn't even recite the first amendment off by heart. You know, it's, it's, don't forget. I mean, this was the guy that popularized the teleprompter in a way we haven't seen before. Um, I don't believe he has the mental faculty to, to be that person. Um, I'm not saying he's dumb. I'm just saying different people have different strengths. Right. Um, he was he was all show, no, and, and very little to back it up. I mean, I, I, I sometimes I 
I really wish I could convene a, a a salon in my in my apartment, and I would have you know George Soros and and Barack Obama, and really grill them on the on their intellectuality because I don't believe these people really do know what they're doing. I, I think they act on on sort of this this liberal emotional plane, uh, whereby they think if we if we behave nice, that must mean we are nice. Whereas actually, what they're doing is just laying down and letting and letting crocodiles eat, eat Western civilization. But I realise we're coming uh, away from 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 the question here. Um, look, I, I don't want to give too much away because obviously it's hard to convey all of these ideas outside of the scope of a book because you know you've read it, you you go line by line, and I take you on a bit of a journey. Uh, you know, I don't throw all these terms out at you at the beginning. There isn't a glossary or anything like that. Uh, that's not what this is. This is this is a, this is this is a storytelling. This is a narrative, and, and you learn as you go. Um, the other reason I'll be quite honest with you is that you know I would need the book in front of me to be able to sort of cross reference all of these things because it's very easy when you're writing a book um, and in the media aftermath of writing the book. But as time progresses, uh, you, you you start learning other things as well, and you start going, oh, I wish I could go back and just find everybody that has that book and just add this little line in here and there and all this sort of stuff. Um, but but look. I want to I want to bring it back a little bit now here to to how this what the all these things and you're asking the best questions by the way I've ever been asked about this book, um, but um, I want to bring it back to the to the issue of the book itself no go zones right um, you have now in this country uh, many people who are being sent to be as you say hafiz people who are being sent to study camps in South Africa to learn the Quran back to front you're you're seeing a a greater uptake in uh, masjid and mosque membership as well as masjid and mosque building uh, across the United States you're seeing private compounds uh, being bought up by groups like Jamaat al Fukra which is a a you know Pakistani based uh, militant group uh, very much a terrorist organization by the way but that's still allowed to freely organize and uh, and have its weapons and its uh, compounds here in the United States a very cult like organization very creepy indeed. Um, you've got Islamburg and Islamville in, in, in South Carolina and in New York State. You've got Dearborn, a place whereby uh, you know the Arab American Museum is pumping out anti-American propaganda, pumping out anti-Israel propaganda. That part made me uh, angry. And I'll be honest, that bothered me a little bit. I mean, trip to the museum. I, I just and do you know what? We were actually just looking for a parking spot to to walk around Dearborn. And we just so happened to park outside the museum, and the museum just so happened to become one of the one of the most interesting parts, I think, of the book, uh, whereby this is sponsored by the Saudi government, Saudi Aramco, the Ford Corporation, the Lear Corporation, the Kresge Foundation, um, and they are pumping out anti-Western propaganda like you wouldn't believe. Now, you know, you remember what it was like being a kid, and you go on a class trip to a museum. I want to know who who's going through that museum and what they're coming out thinking about about Israel, about Jews, uh, about uh, you know America, about its president. Uh, these people are being indoctrinated. And how much time they spend at the activist wall? That, that's uh, I'd like to know that if they're contributing. Right. right, absolutely. This Palestinian nationalist wall, which is effectively just a just a pro Hamas wall. Um, you know, and and. You know, I appreciate the philosophical questions and I appreciate, you know, getting to the underlying issues. But it's so important that we deal with the practicality and the reality of how it's implementing itself here in the Western world as well. So I'd like to wrap it up with that. My last sections are Detroit and America, where you talk about what the warning signs are and some of your suggestions for what we can do about it. One thing you said, I didn't know about the terrorist camps as far back keep, as well. keep, to- keep talking, even though I disappeared sure. for a second. So <laughs> I'll just rant for a while here. In 1992, you said there was one in Colorado. There's been one in California, legit terrorist camps that have been shut down. We don't hear a lot of news about those. Uh, in terms of your suggestions, one of the things you said is that we should stop allowing international bodies to fund mosques here in the United States. Uh, yeah. You also mentioned that Sadi Khan worked as a defense lawyer for Louis Farrakhan. I didn't know that, so I brought that up. But one of the things I thought you did really well is when you talk about Teddy Roosevelt, one of our first uh-huh. Republican progressives, talking about, uh, he said that those who are divided in their allegiance to America are not actually American at all. And I don't know how popular that was back then, but today that could get you stoned. But it's very, very true, right? And I think about this ability George Soros and his people have to cause division, to cause disloyalty and doubt amongst people in their society. That's really what creates these no-go zones, these states within states. And so I want you to expound and take us home in terms of what the long-term deal is there and how we stop it. And also in terms of progressivism, is that not what's happened in the black community? Have we not allowed them? When Jesse Jackson started calling them African-Americans, 
Or is that the beginning of the end for black culture? Is that what we're seeing in the Islamic world in America today? Great questions. Uh, and not not all that I have answers to. I mean, I have opinions. Um, look, uh, I don't... See, in the U.S., you have this really strange term, Muslim-American. Why is Muslim first there? See, in England, we still say British Muslim, which, by the way, I still think is a, is, a, is a nonsense. You're British, or you, you know, forget about it. Um, you have Muslim Americans, and that language really means something. Somebody somewhere has thought about that and the order in which it goes. And, and that, in, you know, you can segregate people with language. We know that, you know, in the, uh, let's, let's all hold our hands up to the fact that this was done, you know, by Europeans as much as it's now being done by, by the Islamic world and by their, their fellow travelers. The only, the only difference is a couple of centuries. We just, we don't play that game anymore. Um, and they're still, they still want to relitigate all of that. And by the way, why, and I didn't mention this in the book, why, let me just see this in, in the minds of those out there. Why are they not tearing down, why are they not burning the Quran, by the way, these, these, these liberals who are tearing down statues? Because it was, it was Islam that put into the heart of Africa the notion of kafir, the notion of the unbeliever, the non-Muslim, as a pejorative, so which, then turned into, which then turned into the word kafir. Now, if we were in South Africa right now, I wouldn't say the word kafir on, on, a, on a podcast. It's effectively their, their version of the N-word. Um, and this, is a, this, is, this was an Islamic, Arabic, Quranic diktat. Well... Why aren't we ter- why aren't we burning the Quran then? In addition to pulling down statues of of, of General Lee, um, so so you see the hypocrisy there too. I, I if I could spend another hour with you, I would, and we'd get into the the, the whole uh, query over the Native American stuff too, because we've got Columbus Day coming up in this country, which is now they're now trying to turn that into Indigenous Peoples Day, right? Uh, but who who are the Indigenous people of the United States? Because the Native Americans came over the Bering Strait from from Eurasia. So how how do they get the claim to being indigenous peoples? Um, it's, you see, if you take this all to its logical extent, none of it ever makes sense. But of course, they don't take it to its logical extent. Um, your question reminds me <laughs> was oh, I thought you were telling me to remind you of something. It was that uh, like to that point in Detroit, you talk about the Chaldeans or Chaldeans, however you say it. Yes. And about how they have very little usefulness for progressive media because they own 15,000 businesses. They have strong family mm. units, traditional values, 40% mm. higher incomes. So in the no-go mm. zone, they were the best cure for that cultural problem. But what you talk mm. about is how the no-go zones are fostered by people who want to use these individuals, as you said earlier. So what in America do we do about it? We know that we have places called Islamburg. We know yeah, that yeah. these are bad things that ha- can happen. And you refer to the hijab as the canary in the coal mine. Next come the bookshops, which I'm not sure what kind of books they sell because they don't translate books in Arabic. They only write them. Well, where, where, where are you? You're based in California, right? Uh, I'm in uh, Phoenix, over your right ear. Oh, you're, 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 in, you're in Phoenix. I love Phoenix, by the way. And I love Prescott the most. Prescott, Arizona is probably my favorite place in the world. Really? It's, 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 where, it's where Barry Goldwater gave his announcement speech in 1963 on those steps. Um, and they've got, uh, you, just, you know, the original whiskey road is in, is in Prescott, Arizona. And I Look commend it you. to everybody. Um, I spent the 4th of July there two years ago. It was absolutely magnificent. Um, I'm going to ask so, you this question. Is it the first time we actually met at the conservative forum in Colorado a couple of years ago? And I think I might've asked mm-hmm. you then because Breitbart London was just starting out. How difficult is it to know what's going on in European news and stay on top of American news? Cause I could not do it. I feel like that's a monumental task. I, oh, I country's enough for that. I work 19, 20 hours a day. That's, wow. that's my average day. Um, and I have to be across all the, all the, all the you know, different news organizations and indeed all the sources that I have in both countries. It's very, very difficult, but I, you know, I enjoy the work I do because I think it's, I think it's for the greater good. Okay. Uh, I can't do it all my life, but I think it's worthwhile doing while I still have the energy. Um, so back to your point of the, of the uh, bookstores and the canary in the coal mine and all that kind of stuff. Look, my solution to this is drive the wedge. Right, drive the wedge between there are Muslims out there, and you might even argue the majority of Muslims out there. It won't be a very big majority, but it will be it will probably be a majority of Muslims out there who don't actually, you know, may not even own a copy of the Quran, um, don't know what the Sharia dictates. Uh, I've actually even seen imams who don't know what's in the Quran. Um, you have people out there who are just who who just want to get get by, right? They just want to own businesses, drive Ubers, uh, work for you know the local 
power plant or, or, or Ford factory, uh, raise their kids, pay their taxes, you know, in as much as anybody wants to pay their taxes. Um, that's, uh, the, that's my new favorite line, by the way. I've, I've used that about 18 times in the last three days. Um, but they exist. Um, and you have to drive a wedge between them and, and those that would, uh, those that would uh, uh, pervert them, uh, and I don't mean pervert Islam, because I I believe the the, the the perverse people are the ones interpreting Islam, literally, fundamentally, and you might say correctly. Um, but you have to you have to drive a wedge between those people, the average person, and the people that would pervert their minds. Um, the Ahmadiyyas, for instance, uh, the Ismailis, the group that I'm from. Um, you have to bulldoze uh, these Islambergs and Islambils. You have to. Uh, you know, Marion Marichal Le Pen, the niece of Marine Le Pen, told me something that stuck with me during her, our interview when I was in France. She said they use our liberties against us. Um, and that's exactly what's going on here. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you compromise on your liberties and your values and your private property instincts and, and all of that. But you also have to say, if you are uh, doing something that is anathema to the U.S. Constitution uh, and to the values of this country, then you know it may it may not stand. This takes you back to Teddy Roosevelt, what he said, and he didn't just say it once, by the way. He said, I think four or five times in speeches and letters that that you know, to the immigrant who does not want to assimilate, we have to tell him to go back, and we've lost that mindset. We've lost that 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 affirmedness in our own selves. Um, that's now seen as some sort of fascistic notion, where in reality it's it's actually self-preservation that's going on. Yeah. Uh, that's what he was communicating there. Um, so you have to drive the wedge uh, between these groups. You have to evidence using people like the Chaldeans and this one lady, as you say, who I uh, she was the head of the Chaldean Chamber of Commerce or whatever it was. Uh, she said to me, you know, the Chaldeans left Mesopotamia, left Iraq, modern day Iraq, um, because they were pushed out by. Um, the Muslim persecuted, uh, and they fled, and they came here, and they are an inc- they, they are one of the best success stories in terms of migrant waves into the United States. And I realize there are many, by the way, but I, I regard them as one of the greatest success stories. Uh, and they, she described to me seeing Muslims and mosques popping up around her as as, as like having post traumatic stress disorder. She said it, it creates PTSD because they think they think that they are about to be persecuted again, uh, and and in and in some ways I, I I can totally already see what's coming down the line for these people. You you see it in the United Kingdom where Ahmadiyya Muslims are murdered by Sunni Muslims, and so you have to drive the wedge. You can't you can't just adopt one strategy or the other. It can't be just be tough against radical Islam. You have to be tough on radical Islam but show where you're also a compassionate and welcoming nation to those who want to assimilate and integrate. By the way, I've never met a conservative who hasn't been just so welcoming to me. You know, they know my background. They know the color of my skin. First, they know right? what my name like, is. When they first meet you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, 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 but, 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 he, but, but all, all the way through, and, and there are reformist Muslims out there in your state, Dr. Zudi Jassa, in in uh, Canada, Rahil Raza, in the United Kingdom, Majid Nawaz. These aren't people whose politics I agree with. I mean, Rahil and Majid are, are liberals. Um, but they are people who don't believe in Sharia. They are people who oppose, uh, um, you know, the, the fundamentalist tenets of, of the Quran. Um, they want to see a reformation within Islam. Meanwhile, the Southern Poverty Law Center calls them Islamophobes calls them uh, haters, describes them as hate groups or hate individuals. Um, this is, you know, if I was the president, if I were the president, I would invite these people into the White House and say, you want, you want to be Muslim in the West? These are, your, these are your people. These are the people you need to listen to. These are the people you need to follow in the way of. Not your local imam who is, like you saw recently in California, that guy who was shouting about uh, uh, killing Jews en masse, yeah. uh, slaughtering Jews en masse. And what did the media do? Well, they covered the story, but then two days later they issued, oh, uh, this imam has issued a heartfelt apology about what he said about slaughtering Jews en masse. Oh, it was a heartfelt apology. That makes it all okay. By the way, how do they know it's heartfelt? How do they know what's in his heart when he's saying that? We already know the takia, the lying to... to, to um, Fool the, fool the unbeliever, fool the non-Muslim. Uh, so for me, you know, I, I suppose the, the Roosevelt thing comes into play with that, comes into play with um, you know, the, the driving the wedge. And, and that, for me, once you read this book, 
you will both be able to identify the bad ones, the good ones, the tolerant ones, the intolerant ones, the fascistic ones, the average everyday ones. Uh, they, they, they exist. Unfortunately, the reason I understand the question always is, why don't we see mass uh, condemnations? Why don't we see uh, marches against terrorism when there's a terrorist attack from within Muslim communities? It's because their leaders, their community leaders, the Council on American and Islamic Relations guys, the Southern Poverty Law Center people, they dissuade people from speaking out against Sharia. They actually make it difficult to be a moderate Muslim. It's not the right that's doing this. It's the left that's doing this. Yeah, and it's, uh, I think it was Antonio Gramsci who referred to it as forceful seduction, right? So don't hit them with hammers and clubs. Don't shoot at them. Make it unpopular to say anything against what you do. And I think for me, Absolutely. the solution is you educate yourself and you learn how to speak it articulately. And this book's a huge step in the right direction. Raheem, this is an outstanding book. I'm going to recommend it to Thank everyone you. that I meet and uh, to everyone who's listening. And I'm also grateful that uh, you're going to be working on another one soon. Is it a sequel to this? Or are you going the Marvel route or are you changing directions? And I also want to get you $2 a book. Let's negotiate you up for the next one. You're gonna have, you're gonna have to wait. The next book actually is, I think, two dollars a book. Um, you're, you're gonna have to wait and see. Um, I'm bound to uh, silence and secrecy at the moment about the next book. It's incredibly topical. Um, I'm working on it. It's going to be out very soon, um, in terms of the book world, anyway. Um, uh, but I, what I will say is this: um, if you are interested in this topic, and if you're interested in how conservative voices and voices like mine are being suppressed, shut down, and, and effectively tried to be eliminated. Voices like yours as well uh, tried to be eliminated. Pay very close attention to this book next week. No go zones. Can't wait. I'm uh, grateful that you wrote it, and I'm grateful that your platform is being extended so you can do more great work because uh, I think you're, you're exceptional. So thank you for coming on. Thank you. Hopefully I can have you on again as a follow-up when, uh, when you make news again. So uh, Raheem, great luck with the rest of your book tour, and thank you for your time. Cheers. Thank you very much.